We are moving on to um, Mary Ann Kinanchui, who is the head of regulatory and public policy at Safaricom. And she is going to be speaking to us on emerging data privacy concerns in the mobile lending sector. Welcome, Mary Ann. Thanks, Mende. Um, very few people call me Mary Ann. <laughs> Uh, most of you go by Koi, um, but yeah. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces uh, from my colleagues at Bake. Um, so glad to be here to be talking to you about data privacy and how it relates to mobile lending in particular. Um, I know you've heard from a lot from a lot of very great speakers on data privacy, um, including the data commissioner herself. So I just wanted to quickly highlight some of the issues that we face at Safaricom and that are being faced in the wider industry as a whole. Um, so I think I'll just start off with the big picture and then go into exactly what's happening for us as a company. Um, so as you know, I, we, we now live in this data era, right? Uh, where every day data has been driven, but it's driving commercial, personal decisions. Uh, data has been used in many interesting ways. It's influencing everything we do. Uh, it's influencing what you see. 80% of the content you watch on Netflix is, you know, influenced by what you've done in the past. Um, so data is really driving our lives. And there's a really, very real and valid concern that's been arising from consumers on how companies like Safaricom, like banks, like financial lenders use that information. Um, I think it's important to note that right now that customers are not happy with the way we use the information. There's a lot of perceptions that... Uh, it's not been stored correctly, that we are using it for our own nefarious reasons. Um, I'll seek to address that later. I can assure you from Safaricom's perspective, that's not quite happening. Um, but I was reading a 2021 uh, KPMG study that came out last month, uh, where they were saying that 86% of customers say that they feel their data and how companies are using it is a real concern to them. 78% um, of them are actually concerned about how that data is collected. And 40% of them say that they don't even trust the companies that are collecting this data and they don't think it will, they'll use it ethically. Um, so by far, you can see there's quite a lot of concerns coming through from the consumers on this particular issue. Um, and I think actually for, for Sparicom and a lot of the companies in our space, how we treat data and how we manage this particular issue going forward is actually going to dictate our success in coming years. If we don't get it right, then we will lose customer trust and that will mean that we'll obviously lose our customers. So we take this quite seriously. Um, and uh, we were looking at a study that was done by McKinsey um, last year, and it was looking at the companies that are kind of among the ones that are more highly trusted when it comes to customer data. Um, and encouragingly uh, for this discussion, they found that the healthcare and the financial services industries are actually some of those that have the highest scores for trust. At the other end of the spectrum is the media and entertainment companies uh, who have a low score of about 10%, which is about nine out of 10 customers actually saying, they don't believe that these guys can keep their data private. And of course, that's probably due to a lot of the factors that I think Richard just spoke about, you know, the data being used for mobile advertising and targeted advertising and other services on their platforms. Is this wrong? Um, I don't think it's wrong. It's only wrong when these companies actually act outside of the laws. And the encouraging news that we have heard, I think, throughout the whole of today is that there are a lot of laws coming up to protect uh, customer data. Um, it's also not wrong unless they, these companies are using this data without the consent of the customer. Um, so I think uh, I wouldn't dwell too much on some of the precedents we've seen. I think some of the speakers have touched on them, but for us in particular, I think GDPR was a huge milestone in terms of creating a framework for the protection of data privacy. Um, like you know, it covers about a hundred regulations and rules that basically aim to just protect customer data. Um, you know, everything from your name and address all the way to your biometric data, or your online address as you link into the Zoom call. So that was a really good inspiration. And we feel that uh, that coming into being actually helps Safaricom start thinking quite comprehensively about how we manage data. Um, of course, as you know, we are a Kenyan company, but a lot of our customers, people who come into the country for roaming, um, a lot of our customers actually could be members of the EU. So we had to start thinking early about how we were going to start complying uh, with this law, even before it came into force uh, more, more comprehensively here in Kenya. Then, of course, in 2019, we had the data protection come into force. Um, it's largely modeled on the GDPR, which is great. Um, also, you know, it kind of introduces concepts like controllers and processors, which is very important in terms of defining who has access to which information and what they can do with it. Um, and I think if I was to just uh, kind of capture what 
makes these two laws uh, very pivotal for our sector is the fact that they really capture the element of data minimalization. Um, so they, they talk about you know, what data should be collected by an, about an individual, by an organization. Um, and that's a very key discussion for us to have. I'm sure a lot of you have felt the pain uh, as I have, uh, where organizations in Kenya seem to have access to your data and there's no rules governing that. Well, now we have a law um, which makes it impossible to ensure that these people actually behave within the boundaries of the existing laws. Um, so before, like I mentioned, the, the Data Protection Act came into existence, we had started thinking at Safaricom about how we could actually start the journey towards ensuring our customer data was adhering to the best practices that we were seeing globally. Um, so we looked at GDPR um, and tried to kind of align our processes and, uh, and, and thoughts with that um, from the beginning. Um, and then once DPA was actually enacted in Kenya, um, we worked very closely with our local and global partners to make sure that we were all compliant and also provided support and have started providing support actually um, for those partners to ensure that we all are implementing data privacy and working from the same page when it comes to protecting our customers. Um, internally, we've also embarked on a very rigorous program of ensuring our data protection practices are up to global standards. Um, so for instance, we've, uh, we've cascaded the ISO 27,000 training on the security standards and certification across the entire company. So nobody working here has not gone through that training. They understand uh, what is expected from, in their, from them in their various roles. Uh, we also have a fully fledged data privacy team. Uh, we have a data protection officer as is required under the, the new law in Kenya. Um, and generally we've tried to take a proactive approach to ensuring that data protection remains at the forefront of our activities as a company um, going forward. We believe that the act is very pro progressive and it will actually create a wide framework um, that will protect customers ultimately in Kenya. Um, so with that context, I will go back to the topic which I was initially invited to speak about, which is uh, you know, how data protection works in the world of mobile financial services. Um, and here it's a tricky balance, right? Because to provide mobile financial services, you actually need to collect the data from your customers. Um, and most of the times that data is actually the most private data for your customer. It's about their credit history, it's about their, their identification documents, it's about how they're using your services. So how do we handle this balance? I think, like I've mentioned, we had already um, started adhering to the data protection uh, principles that were captured in GDPR, even before the Data Protection Act came into force. Um, but beyond that, remember, there were laws and regulations that were governing our sector before this, um, particularly those uh, that were regulated by the Central Bank of Kenya, particularly those that are regulated by the Communications Authority of Kenya, the Competition Authority of Kenya, and of course now the Office of the Data Commissioner. Um, so they each regulate laws that have provisions for how data, the customer data can actually be used by organizations. Um, so within our industry, which is the, you know, at the junction of telecommunications and financial services, um, we have to make sure that we have accurate data on our customers. And that's of course comes from the banking sector where a lot of our, our products and services kind of um, have come from, have evolved from. And so we need to make sure that we have anti-money laundering and know your customer obligations met. Um, and the collection of data really starts from the onboarding of our customer to our network uh, really to all the way to the services and where they may actually choose to, to participate in, where their personal data is collected a bit more frequently. In mobile money, there's an actual uh, consideration um, where we have additional consideration, sorry, where we have mobile money agents who are responsible for collecting this data as well. As you can imagine, we have tens of thousands of these uh, agents across the country. Um, so our role really as Safaricom is to ensure that when they collect that data, they are adhering to not only our own rules, but to the local laws, as well as the more global laws we have around privacy and the collection of data. Um, so I think because of the fast evolving nature of our industry, while the laws are there and in place, we actually operate from a position of uh, creating a privacy by design perspective, which means that we believe we have to kind of anticipate what's coming down the line. Uh, we have to think beyond the existing laws to anticipate any threats or risks to customer data as they emerge. Remember, Kenya is one of the foremost uh, markets for mobile money services. Um, so that means that we have to kind of think ahead of the curve when it comes to regulating the whole space around data protection, especially when it comes to mobile money. Um, we're also aware that you know, there's, we exist in a growing industry, so we're not alone in this. 
Um, there's the banking partners, and we partner with all the banks in Kenya. There's a lot of emergence of new players in the market, the mobile lending firms um, that offer fast loans and credit advances. I think this is a positive development. Um, it's allowed Kenya to actually really enjoy the fruits of innovation when it comes to mobile uh, financial services. And it gives you know, those customers access to quick and convenient options for credit. Um, there are now about 49 million, 40, 49 mobile lending applications in Kenya, um, and they have 19 million customers. I think that's good traction. But of course, there's some negative elements, which I think is why I was invited to speak at this particular forum. Um, and those really surround about how those providers gather their data and what they use that data for. Um, so as we know, I'm sure you've all experienced it on a personal level. Sometimes these providers gather too much data and use this for other reasons, you know, for harassing people who have not paid up their debts. Um, so I think the good news on that particular front is that these apps are now subject to the Data Protection Act. Um, as they're digital platforms, they're also subject to consumer protection laws, which are enforced and overseen by the, the Communications Authority of Kenya, as well as the Competition Authority of Kenya as well. And I think it's encouraging that the Central Bank of Kenya is also seeking to introduce some legislative interventions. They want to regulate digital lenders who will now have to be licensed in the same way that other financial institutions are so that they can be effectively regulated. Um, so in time, I think we'll see the overuse of this customer data actually start to be managed by provisions in the law. But I think there's a lot of responsibility that also lies in the hands of the customer. Um, the reason why you get people calling you, your relatives and your friends for your debts once you use these apps is because you have actually signed up to the terms and conditions. So for, for customers to protect themselves in this you know, increasingly complex space where their data is being used by these companies, they have to first ensure that they understand what they're signing up for. Um, I think it's important for all of us to take the time to understand what the product offer is. Um, to ensure that we read the terms and conditions. Many of us just click the agree button and move on and hopefully get access to the money and you know, we move on in our lives, but we're not realizing that we're actually signing over quite a significant chunk of our data. Um, sometimes it's just you know, your contact address book in your phone. Sometimes it's your location data. It ranges with the app, um, but if you don't, if you're not aware, then you be, might be surprised the fact that these people have a lot of information on you. Um, it's also important to know the provider, what the provider does with that information, because they may be using it to provide you with a loan in the short term. Um, they may be selling that information to third parties um, and, and you know, basically trying to make some commercial gain from the information. Um, so first, I think the first step really starts with us as uh, consumers of these services is to ensure that we protect our data and that we make sure that it's been used in the right way. Um, I think the second thing is also to remember that uh, Data sharing also has some good elements, yeah? Um, as long as it's done within the law and within the boundaries of the relevant regulations, it can actually enhance our experiences with various platforms and products and services. Um, digital identity tools and authentication actually plays a very vital role in bringing lots of people into the financial services system very swiftly and securely. And it kind of promotes a lending culture, um, which if managed correctly, can be very beneficial to the economy. Um, but it's important, of course, like I said before, that uh, consumers understand exactly what access they're giving to these uh, providers um, and they take control of how that data has been shared and make sure it aligns with what's been adopted in our local laws as well as in the international uh, best practices. Um, so as I close, um, I'd just like to remind us that, you know, while um, I think there's a lot of negatives that we tend to think about when we think of data protection, especially as it relates to mobile lending. There's a lot of opportunity as well. And this industry is just about to take off in my view. Um, and it provides us with an opportunity to actually get closer to more in financial inclusion for a wider segment of the population and deepens access to credit, which is very critical for our growth um, going forward. And particularly when it is delivered by mobile technology, which of course, as you know, is kind of the first contact point for a lot of our customers in this part of the world. Um, so in closing, I'll just say that digital lending um, has the potential to transform how we interact with the financial ecosystem. It benefits um, for all stakeholders, um, but we must ensure that every player, and that includes Safaricom, um, plays by the rules of data protection and privacy. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Monday.